Drones hit Moscow, lower numbers hit China, and Washington works hard not to hit the debt ceiling. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, special contributor Larry Summers of Harvard on the stubbornly strong labor market and what it means for inflation. There's something about the underlying strength of the economy that they're missing. And former IBM CEO Sam Palmisano on just how big generative AI could get and what could stop it. You need some kind of a cognition a capability, which it does not have. Global Wall Street started the week watching drone hits in Moscow, perhaps as a precursor to a counteroffensive in Ukraine. We're able to reach you right in the heart of Russia, and these attacks are really about sort of like sending that message. So it's quite embarrassing for Russia that this is happening. We spent another week on the debt ceiling in Washington, but this time it wasn't about getting a deal, but about getting it all behind us, at least for a couple of years. We're going to deal with the debt ceiling. I think things are going as planned. Tonight, we all made history, because this is the biggest cut in savings this Congress has ever voted for. And as expected, not everyone was happy. Not one Republican should vote for this deal. Not one. China got some bad economic news, raising more questions about the speed of its recovery. China's manufacturing activity contracted for a second straight month in May. It's more evidence that the post-COVID recovery has slowed in the world's second largest economy. But here in the United States, the jobs machine, well, it just kept on going, adding 339,000 new jobs in the month of May. That was way more than the 195,000 that was estimated, while unemployment actually rose up from 3.4 percent to 3.7 percent, which set the markets off to the races, with the S&P 500 up 1.83 percent for the week, almost all of it on Friday alone. The Nasdaq was up a bit more, adding 2.04 percent for the week, while the bond markets almost did a round trip, starting the week just under 3.8 percent on the 10-year yield, dipping well below 3.6 percent at one point, and then coming back to just under 3.7 percent on Friday as people returned to thinking about possible rate hikes. To take us through the week in the markets, welcome now Barbara Reinhardt. She's Voya Capital Head of Asset Allocation and Aaron Brown, PIMCO Multi-Asset Strategy Portfolio Manager. So welcome back to both of you. Great to have you here. Barbara, let me start with you about what we're seeing in the markets. We saw some numbers on Friday and you get the, the, the economy overall looks pretty strong, at least when it comes to jobs. Mm -hmm. How are the markets reacting to all this information? It was a strange employment report, right? So you, it didn't coincide with necessarily some of the other data that we're looking at looking at, such as NFIB, hiring intentions, the home base data, they would have told you that the labor market would have been a lot weaker than the number that we had printed today. But the good news is, and that what the equity market held on to, is the gentle decline in average hourly earnings. And that is good news on the inflation side, because you've had very sticky inflation. It's been coming down, but coming down probably slower than what people expected. But to see the easing in the wage data is a very good positive development. So, Aaron, it raises necessarily the question, what is the Fed going to do? Did, does the Fed say, boy, that's a lot, a lot of jobs, therefore we're going to have to raise again? Or can they pause or skip or whatever they're calling it these days, the way they've been telegraphing? It certainly throws a wrench, you know, certainly into how the Fed's thinking about the evolution of the economy. And, you know, just earlier this week, there were comments on the tape from various Fed governors, Powell included, you know, that we're hinting at a potential pause at the upcoming FOMC meeting, and certainly the timing of this release is inconvenient. That said, you know, I wouldn't get too hung up on whether or not the Fed hikes one additional time or not. You know, most likely they will pause at this upcoming meeting, but do a hawkish pause, meaning, you know, they'll talk about the potential for further rate hikes uh, down the line if the data doesn't evolve the way that they're hoping it will. Um, but but I think what is important to keep in mind, at least from an investor perspective, is whether or not they hike one additional time or not, it really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. The, the lagged effects of monetary policy is really what's going to matter. The significant amount of tightening that happened last year is still needs to work its way through the system and still will continue to tighten 
financial conditions for the market and for the economy overall. And that's the bigger picture of what's going on right now and what's ultimately going to you know, potentially affect the economy and lead to a further slowdown from here. Barbara, we've heard an awful lot about this lag in the effects yeah. from monetary policy. How long a lag should we expect? Because, boy, yeah. it doesn't seem to be showing up very profoundly so far. So it tends to be about, um, you know, when the Federal Reserve started hiking interest rates, it was about, 20, about 14 months ago. There tends to be a lag of about 24 months between when the Fed starts hiking and when you start to see a dramatic slowdown in inflation. That means we should have at least the rest of this year into the first quarter of 24 before you start to see a significant slowdown in inflation. Look, when you look at things like the sticky price CPI or the underlying inflation gauge, they were at you know between 6 and 7 percent just six months ago. They're down now to about 3.5 to 4.5 percent well above the Fed's target, but they're going in the right direction. In order to get down to the 2% on inflation, which is the Fed's target, you likely need to see a little bit more time go by. Think about this, David. The real issue is that the Fed hikes, the 75 basis points that they did over the course of three or four meetings last year, they happened in the third and fourth quarters of last year. You need at least 12 months for that to start to be felt by the economy and start to see the slowdown. You're seeing it in some of the data change indexes. You're starting to see some slowing, uh, certainly not indicative of the labor market this morning uh, on that report. But I would say that data can change and can change relatively quickly. So I would think that you've got more slowing coming ahead of you, even if the Fed did nothing going forward. Aaron, when you talk about data changing quickly, I'm going to make a shift here over to AI and tech. Well, we've seen a big change quickly in that. Uh, how much of this is a tale of two very different equity markets, one of which is a relatively narrow tech, big tech, driven by AI and the rest of the market going a different direction? I think you're exactly right. I mean, the market breadth or the leadership has been incredibly narrow for the S&P 500 this year. In fact, if you look at just the equal weighted S&P 500, it's actually down on the year. Yet tech has had a stellar performance. A lot of that is off of very weak performance last year. But certainly AI and automation has gotten the markets excited about future growth prospects for our, the tech sector. And this is another avenue of growth. Keep in mind, even for NVIDIA, which is one of the leading, you know, semiconductor manufacturers and, and um, design designers rather, and, and, you know, certainly has a leadership role with respect to AI, it's an incredibly small percentage of current sales. And so really what you're betting on within the tech sector right now is future growth. This is secular growth for the tech sector, not something that's really going to turn up materially in earnings over the next uh, several quarters. And so I think that the market has gotten excited about this theme, but it's probably a little bit of ahead of itself in terms of price action, just given the fact it's not going to materialize in earnings anytime soon. You know, that said, I think that the market this year came in looking for, you know, opportunities to, to buy, to bottom pick um, underperformers last year. And you've seen it with the tech sector, you've seen it with the retailers, you've seen it, you know, sort of uh, you know, across the board, um, but but these are really more idiosyncratic rather than, you know, the market breadth overall, which has been narrow. And so that to me is is telling me that you know potentially the market's getting a little bit tired, um, and and potentially we may be in for tougher days ahead uh, as leadership, you know, starts to narrow. That tends to not be you know the greatest investor for the average, the greatest environment rather for the average investor. Okay, just to check in on the Bloomberg Elves, in case you're following this, the Bloomberg Elves have a year-end median of 4,000. We're well above that now at the end of this week. Although we did have one Elf, actually, Laura Calvacina of RBC Capital Markets, who took her estimate up to 4,250, which is closer to where we are. So we'll keep uh, praising the Elves on how they're doing on their predictions. In the meantime, Barbara Reinhardt and Aaron Brown will be staying with us as we consider what is going on with the T-bill market in the aftermath of that debt crisis. That's coming up next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Street Week. I'm David Weston. It's not just U.S. investors who drive U.S. markets. We also pay attention to foreign investors in U.S. securities. And Torsten Slock of Apollo is here with one of his charts 
to show where foreign investors are putting their money. So before the pandemic, there was appetite among foreigners for buying, in particular, U.S. government bonds and also U.S. equities. Foreigners have also historically bought a lot of U.S. credit, but broadly speaking, the trends were that foreigners had appetite for buying both U.S. fixed income and buying U.S. equities. So over the months ahead, we still have that the Federal Reserve is doing quantitative tightening to the tune of roughly $60 billion every single month. At the same time, we also have a budget deficit, which is roughly around 5% of GDP, and that amounts to roughly, in round numbers, about $100 billion in issuance of treasuries every single month. Combining both QT and the budget deficit with this new issuance on the other side of this debt ceiling deal now potentially being quite substantial, it does raise questions about who is it that will be buying treasuries, in particular in an environment where the hedging costs for foreigners continue to be quite elevated? Aaron Brown of PIMCO and Barbara Reinhardt of Voya are still with us. So, Aaron, let me start with you here. We've been following this after the debt ceiling got put behind us. It's fortunately did this week. There's the question of replenishing the larder, essentially, in the U.S. Treasury to get their, their stock back up. It's going to be a lot of T-bills. Do we have the buyers for those T-bills? As Torsten mentioned, I mean, the challenge is from a foreigner's perspective, if you're a Japanese investor and you're looking to buy 10-year government bonds, after the FX hedging cost um, measured by the sort of three-month uh, you know, FX forward hedge, it will, co it will cost you negative 2%. Your, your yield that you're getting is about negative 2.2% on a 10-year bond. You can buy JGBs for about 40 basis points. So from a foreigner's perspective, it's better to buy the local bonds than to take into account the FX hedging costs and buy a U.S. Treasury bond, even though U.S. Treasuries, at least from a, a yield perspective in the U.S., is yielding more. So it's really unattractive right now just because of FX hedging costs to buy U.S. government bonds from a foreigner's perspective. You know, there's another uh, prob a wrinkle that I'm going to throw into, you know, the, the challenge that we have with respect to supply. Not only do we need to refill the coffers of the, the, the TGA, and we have to fund the fiscal deficit, but also keep in mind from an international perspective, you have, you're gonna ha start to have the uh, TLGROs also that are going to um, you know, start adding to additional supply uh, in, in Europe as well. So you have a lot of uh, government supply that's going to be you know, hitting the market in the second half of this year, yeah. which is going to you know, create a challenge um, certainly you know, in terms of, or raise the question in terms of who's going to be the incremental buyer for yeah. that. So, so, the, the problem with the debt ceiling yeah. um, being passed, I mean, I mean, it's good from a political right. perspective and good from a stability perspective, but it does mean that um, you, you now have have to refill those coffers. There's going to be a significant amount of issuance right. over the next couple of months, yeah. and the Treasury is saying that they want to rebuild to yeah. about $600 billion yeah. on that TGA, right. which means a significant amount of issuance over the next uh, three to four months. So, Barbara, I must confess, I hadn't thought about the Teltro issue, but right. whatever it is, what's it going to do to liquidity in the marketplace, and what could that mean as a practical matter? That money's got to come from someplace. It does, but a lot of times you're talking about cash buyers moving over to a different cash instrument. In the past 20 years, there have been four times that the Treasury general account has had to raise significant amount of assets, like it is this time. Each time it was able to do it without an issue. We don't rule out that something could potentially be amiss this time and cause some indigestion, but the Fed is very well versed in the plumbing of the Treasury market, and we don't think that it's necessarily going to be a, a very big issue for the, for the front-end market. Plus, also think about this. You're now getting interest rates that are almost in excess of headline inflation to be parked in T-bills, right? So it's just a very attractive investment for, for many investors. And many of the bank depositors are looking at the T-bill market thinking, I can go over to money markets and get much better rates of interest. So I think there's going to be a lot of natural buyers. What does that mean, uh, potentially just... for the banks, actually, for their capacity to lend, Barbara? Yeah. Because that sounds good from the depositor's point of view. Right. But what for the bank's point of view? They may not have as much to lend. I don't think that JP Morgan's going to have a problem with that, not speaking about a company very specifically. Mm -hmm. But I do think that, look, the smaller regional banks do have the issue with commercial real estate and with local lending. That's a little bit of a different story. But those are not your big money market. Those are not your big money market buyers. Your big 
buyers that are coming from the you know significant amount of deposits that are in the major money center banks, I don't think you're going to have an issue with it. The TGA should be able to be refunded with very little problems in the market. Aaron, I interrupted you. No, no. So I, you know, I, I, I take a slightly different approach. I think that you know there's two ways or two liabilities that need to adjust lower as the TGA. Uh, gets rebuilt. The first is through the reverse repo facility. Now, as Barbara said, if you had um, TGA rebuild be very cleanly met with um, a, a reverse repo offset. So as TGA goes up, reverse repos go down, then that should have no impact on liquidity. However, I do think that restrictions are going to emerge, particularly because right now the banks or are, 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 uh, money markets are getting a really good deal by parking the money at the Fed. They're getting you know five basis points over uh, the 5% level. So they're getting about 5.05%. Right now, Treasury bills have been trading below that. Yeah. So that means that to make it attractive for money markets to move over into buying bills, you're going to have to see bills go up in yield. The second right. is that with respect to bank reserves, um, as, revert, right. as reserves leave the system, uh -huh. that does put, um, that generally means that deposits are leaving banks. Yeah. And that generally means that it ha hurts credit yep. creation Some, in the general economy. So I that, actually think it's going to be a bigger impact on liquidity. Something that has been an issue. Thank you so very much to Barbara Reinhardt of Voya Capital and Aaron Brown of PIMCO. Now, now this week, we marked the 100th birthday of Henry Kissinger, the man who laid the foundation for the most important economic relationship in the world. That was, of course, the one between the United States and China. So we went back and found an interview Dr. Kissinger did with Louis Ruckheiser back in 1990, when China's GDP was a mere $360 billion compared to the $18 trillion that it is today. Do you think we still have important economic opportunities in China? I think we do, and I'm, I'm in favor of maintaining a working relationship with China. It is too important a country. It had made good progress in economic uh, reform, and I think we should not lightly sacrifice a relationship with the country with the longest continuing history in Asia, with the cultural influence that it has. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Investing that takes into account environmental, social, and governance issues has been all the rage, with Bloomberg estimating that ESG funds will reach over $50 trillion worldwide by 2025. But the issue has become increasingly politicized in the United States, in sharp contrast with Europe and with Canada. To explain that gap and where it could take us, we welcome now Eileen O'Connor, Rockefeller Foundation Senior Vice President for Strategic Communications and Policy. So, Eileen, thank you so much for joining us. You talk to a lot of the big institutional investors, things like pension plans in Europe and the United States, as well as the fund managers that invest their funds. What are you hearing in terms of a divergence, possible divergence between Europe and the United States? Well, there's incredible frustration of U.S. pension funds because they understand that this is actually bad for business and particularly bad for their investors. And we're already seeing that in some conservative states where there's proposed anti-ESG legislation, some of those even uh, Republican pension fund managers are pushing back and saying that it's going to cost their pensioners uh, billions of dollars both in fees to convert and to pull out of investments, but also in losses over the next few years. And the reason for this is that if the United States businesses don't start investing in the technologies that could abate greenhouse gas emissions and also adapt to a warming climate, we are going to be losing out as a country and as an economy because Europe and Asia, and particularly China, are investing in these technologies because they understand that climate change is very real, that human activity and fossil fuels are major causes, as well as some of the ways we, we grow our food and use other technologies. And so they are now already converting their energy systems. They are investing in battery storage, electric vehicles, electric stoves, and other things. And, and the United States business, if, if there is a chilling effect by this anti-ESG legislation, it's business that's going to 
lose out, and also consumers and the economy in general. Before you even get to the investments, you can talk to just about talking about it, because we're having difficulty sometimes getting people even to come on and talk about the issue because it's so politicized. And there's actually partisan politics going on with people's houses. They're sending up picket lines in people's houses. Are you having a difficult time getting even people to discuss it publicly? Yes. I, businesses, I mean, I have been, you know, I've, I'm also uh, was a corporate lawyer, and I've been speaking to some of my former partners who are representing companies and who are basically afraid to talk about the fact that these investments are good investments. I mean, over the years, uh, investing in new technologies has driven down the cost of solar and is driving down the cost of battery storage. These are very good investments, and they will actually lead to economic growth. The other thing is these businesses know that they have to also, you know, they have to address climate change because they have to address the risk of climate change. We already know that even this year alone, we've had seven billion dollar uh, climate weather events. That's what NOAA calls them. They are they actually caused over a billion dollars worth of loss and damage to businesses and to people in the United States. And those instances are rising tremendously over the last few years. And so that is another thing that businesses want to do. They want to make profit, but they want to avoid cost, obviously. And so that's a risk that they're that they are also looking at. And I would also say that, you know, interestingly, Norway's Sovereign Wealth Fund is really taking that risk seriously. They're basically saying that they're not going to invest in companies that don't take a mitigation of climate risk into account when they're making investments. They will actually de disinvest from those companies is what they're saying in a statement. Eileen, when we talk about ESG, I'll plead guilty to this. Often I think about the E, the environmental, some of the climate issues you just were talking about. But there is an S and a G as well. And it does strike me that one of the issues that is really involved here, and again, it's become very political, is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, to what extent are we having difficulty taking that into account in talking about and making investments? Well, that too has become incredibly politicized in, in what's known as these culture wars. And, and again, too, DEI and training on DEI, and there's a lot of legislation that says, you know, we don't want business to, to invest in, in diversity, equity, and inclusion, in hiring diverse uh, people, arguing that it's actually bad for business, that they're less qualified, and also not to invest in in leadership training, inclusive leadership training, that that is a cost that they should avoid. That's actually also counterfactual because the facts show that when you have a diverse workforce with inclusive leadership that listens to those employees, that takes into account their views, you actually add value to the company. You actually create better outcomes on decisions because of the diverse uh, viewpoints of those people. So again, that's another thing that is really counter to the facts. So the argument that that's bad for business is actually not true. In fact, DEI and inclusive leadership training is very good for business. Uh, so finally, Eileen, uh, I want to go back to your day job. What are you doing at Rockefeller Foundation to address these issues? Well, we're actually using, you know, one of the problems we have in addressing climate change, there is a huge capital gap in what's needed from public funding, philanthropic funding, and private funding in, in enabling countries, particularly in developing markets, to transition to sustainable uh, energy systems. And unless we actually can decommission coal plants in some of these developing economies like South Africa, Ch India, um, Vietnam, and Indonesia, we're never going to keep the warming of the client, bo climate below two degrees Celsius. And above two degrees Celsius, it's really catastrophic effects. I mean, it's really great to talk to you. Thank you so much. I suspect it's not the last time we'll have an opportunity to talk about this. That's Eileen O'Connor of the Rockefeller Foundation. Coming up, how big could generative AI get? And could it really lead to mass extinction? We ask former IBM head Sam Palmisano. This technology makes you feel like you're actually getting something that's correct, you know, right? But it's not. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg.
artificial intelligence. It's been with us for longer than we think. Bank of America's Brian Moynihan says they've been using it for at least five years. We have this thing called Erica, which is a virtual artificial intelligence, virtual assistant, natural language processing, predictive technology that we've been running for four or five years. And people like J.P. Morgan's Jamie Dimon insist that it is transformational. AI is real. This is not... Not crypto? That's not crypto. This is a technology which is staggering. With AI pioneer Samuel Altman telling Congress... We think it can be a printing press moment. We have to work together to make it so. But now there are those who are warning about some of the downsides. With tech veterans like Carly Fiorina agreeing with OpenAI's Samuel Altman that there needs to be regulation. Big tech has to say, we alone are not in charge and we alone cannot control this. And a group of AI industry leaders this week wrote an open letter warning that what they are building could lead to a risk of extinction. And to take us through some of the possible impediments to generative AI, as well as the risks involved, welcome now Sam Palmasano. He is now the chairman of the Center for Global Enterprise, but of course, for many years, he was the chair and CEO of IBM. So Sam, welcome back to Wall Street Week. Really great to have you here. Uh, let's start, first of all, with uh, exactly how big this generative AI could be. We've seen NVIDIA this, this week really explode in its market capitalization. Is it overhyped, do you think? Is it as big as people say? Uh, David, well, first of all, thank you for having me. No, I think it's that big. This is transformational technology, but it's early stage. But I mean, I always draw the analogy to the Internet, because if you think back where it began ex exchanging technical documents around the world in the 70s to what it's become today, 50 years later, a lot had happened in innovation and development and regulation and guidance, et cetera. Uh, all that has to happen with generative AI or large language models. But it is that transformation, transformational because like the browser for the internet made it kind of user friendly for people to actually get in there and look up information or search. This will do the same thing as far as AI is concerned for people to use natural language to interface to it and get responses that are uh, very much like human being responses. So if it is transformational, as you say, what are we going to need to have it be that transformational? What are some of the key inputs? Let's start, for example, with microchips. Uh, that's what's driving NVIDIA to a large degree and maybe some other chip manufacturers as well. What is the need there? Well, basically, this is going to be, it requires massive infrastructure. And today you think about it as hyperscalers is the term or cloud computing service providers like Amazon, Google, Microsoft, et cetera. Uh, having said that, this is uh, huge demands on capacity and performance of that capacity, therefore the chips and the advantage that NVIDIA has is these things, graphical processing units that are called GPUs. Uh, those technologies themselves are much better performers than the classic uh, Intel chip, which referred to as x86 technology. So fundamentally, you need that level of performance uh, to run this, like these natural language models, because they're so large, the data sets are so large and require so many interconnections that you need the performance to be acceptable to the end user. Uh, one of the things we hear about is energy also. It, it didn't seem that long ago that we were talking about crypto mining and how what a big drain that was for energy. In fact, China really cut back on some of the mining there in China. Uh, what is the demand potentially in this transformational generative AI or LLM? What is the demand for energy? Oh, it's the same as all these large cloud service data centers. I mean, it's massive. I mean, you could model those as if they're nuclear reactors. That's how much energy they consume. Now, there's a lot that can be done. I mean, quite honestly, around the utilization of this infrastructure to cut the energy costs, there's ways you can use June green energy to, to su supplement the classical forms of electricity and those sorts of things. But there are lots of techniques associated with how to reduce that, but energy is going to be significant. Uh, there's no doubt about it. It already is. I mean, it has been for years in these large, whether they were supercomputers in the old days or now the cloud infrastructure providers, it's the same issue. They require significant amounts of energy. Uh, so, Sam, we've heard an awful lot about the wonderful things that uh, generative AI could bring us, uh, not least of which is increased productivity. There are remarkable uh, projections here of trillions of dollars of increased production because of uh, generative AI. Then we had a letter that came out this week from a group of AI experts, people should know about this, warning about the risks and even saying there's a risk of extinction if we're not careful. Is that overblown? Well, I tell you, let me tell you what the risks are. I don't know if it's extinction, but the risks are, quite honestly, 
this technology makes you feel like you're actually getting something that's correct, you know, right? But it's not. It's not valid. And what it's doing basically at the engineering design is connecting large scale words together. But there's no checking to the source of the words. There's no fact checking as the conclusions these words reach. In some cases, it's a terrific essay that it's prepared. Maybe it's a great book that it's written or a wonderful poem. But at the end of the day, if you need accuracy and you have to have accuracy, like in healthcare, if you were depending upon your diagnostics, you would not use ChatGBT. I mean, you want to have a doctor or some human of some kind that looked at the conclusion that it reached, even though it probably read all the medical journals like we did in Watson Health. You need some kind of a cognition uh, capability, which it does not have. I think people get confused by what it does have because it's so it's so easy to use. It's so I mean, it's very very attractive. There's no doubt about it. But it needs to be enhanced with some of these capabilities that will address the concerns that are in that article today about worrying about it could be like nuclear warfare in the future. I mean, if you think about applications that could have a short-term impact that. You would like to have facts, but don't have any facts. Take political propaganda uh, as an example of that, or political campaigns. I mean, you'd like to have some facts and all that information, but we all know they don't exist. And I'm not sure that the proponents of all that information really want the facts out there anyway. Sam, is that risk, is that weakness about actually truth checking, is that inherent in large language models? Is it inherent in generative AI? Or is it something with new iterations actually, it could take over itself so it could actually check itself? Uh, what, what, you, what needs to be done is the self checking, like you said. That does not exist today. I make the argument that the inventors of this technology that are raising all these alarms knew about these alarms and they could have written some of these checkers, these tracing of the information or transparency of the data into the actual technology itself. Now, however, you know, I understand that they raise the concerns. They are very, very valid concerns. However, if you are the inventor or the guys coming up with this technology, you knew this and you could have prepared for this, but now it has to be done. I mean, it's great technology, it's transformational, but now it has to be done and it will be done. And there's gonna be lots of small innovative companies that are gonna take advantage of that gap and add that capability. What's the government to do? Uh, it depends, you know, right? This, this is a great dilemma. And I take you back to the early days of the internet. I mean, in the early days of the internet, the government decided to take a light hand of guidance to the internet. And the reason being that they would like to see the innovation uh, could grow and accelerate before they actually put the, let's say, the, the regulations in place. And they're still trying to do that today as you look at data privacy and those kinds of issues, uh, which are very, very valid issues. And this is the same thing. I think in the beginning, how do you regulate something that you don't know what it is? And we really don't know. We have concerns about what it could be, but that's not what it is today. So uh, my suggestion to the people that are raising all these concerns is they work with the, obviously the technologists, the, the private sector, the academic universities, government regulations, and come up with guardrails, guardrails, not regulations. Because once you put this in law or code, you can, it never gets reversed. And I don't think we know enough today to put that in a, in a responsible way, put that in place. I know some of the founders of the technology are calling for that. I understand that it's, I understand why they're raising those concerns. However, it's the actual details that matter in this case. And you're trading off innovation because you could solve massive societal problems with this technology. I mean, just think about where we have inadequacies of consistency of quality. A healthcare is a system that doesn't have consistency of quality. Suppose you made everybody an expert in healthcare, how much better we all would be. Education, how much better will we all would be. So there's great benefit in the technology. I just think that we ought to approach it in a maybe a little more heavier hand than the internet, but certainly not a heavy handed regulation that perhaps is existing today in China. Okay, Sam, it's always such a pleasure to have you here on Wall Street Week. That's Sam Palmasano. He is now the chairman of the Center for Global Enterprise. Coming up, we wrap up the week with our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg.
This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We're joined once again by a very special contributor here. He is Larry Summers of Harvard. So, Larry, we have to start with those jobs numbers that came out on Friday. A lot more than expected, 339,000 jobs. At the same time, we also had an increase in uh, wages and we had an increase in unemployment. What do you make of this surprise number, I think, for most people? Look, I think these are strong numbers uh, in total. 339,000 jobs is a lot. There were upward revisions for the previous two months. We've always known that the monthly unemployment rate is a very noisy series. That's especially true in May when you got all the seasonal adjustments going on with respect to the kids who are leaving school and looking for uh, summer uh, jobs. So I think you have to read this report as uh, strong. I think the forecasting community's got to do a little soul searching. They've been low on this report for 14 months uh, in a row. That has got to suggest that there's something about the underlying strength of the economy that they're missing. Or another way to put it is that they are exaggerating the impact and efficacy of monetary policy in uh, slowing uh, the economy down. So I read these as a strong report, and I think the general tendency of the data has been very much uh, towards saying that the economy, at least for this while, has a fair amount of uh, robustness in it. Uh, going beyond the jobs numbers out this week, the other big development of the economy, I dare say, is that package that did make it through, actually, the Congress, that took care of the debt ceiling problem. I wonder what you make of that package, and maybe more specifically, what it means for the fiscal policy of the United States of America. David, before I say something about the debt limit uh, issues, I want to just say that with that behind us, with these employment uh, figures, with the general evidence of robustness in the economy, I think the lower risk strategy is for the Fed to raise rates uh, in June. It's a close call. And if they don't raise rates in June, I think they have to be open to the possibility that they may have to raise rates by 50 basis points in July if the economy continues to stay way hot and if uh, inflation figures are robust. I saw that some of the governors have been saying that maybe the Fed can move to a mode of raising rates by 25 basis points only every other meeting. It's certainly possible that that's a mode that they can move into, but for there to be any sense of commitment uh, to that, given the risks, would, I think, be repeating the kind of mistakes that the Fed has made repeatedly over the last uh, several uh, years. I vacillated after the first run of serious banking uh, issues, but seeing where we are now, seeing the general picture in markets, I think we are again in a situation where the risks of overheating the economy are the primary risks that the Fed needs uh, to be mindful of. And of course, that's just reinforced by the fact that we've put the debt limit and the potential loss of confidence uh, from it uh, very much uh, behind us by reaching uh, this deal. Look, the thing I'm worried about coming out of this deal is not what happens in the near term. The IRS provisions there, I think, are really a serious uh, error, and we're missing a chance to catch lots of people who have just cheated on their taxes, who are going to go undiscovered. And because we're not investing enough, we're going to probably have even more people playing uh, the audit lottery. And that's a mistake, a serious mistake. But I think the really big issue that focus is going to need to turn to is the long run fiscal picture of the country. CBO says that we're headed to a projected deficit more than twice as large as the one we had when we set off the Simpson Bowles uh, process, more than 75% larger than the one that was there when Bill Clinton 
uh, came in as uh, president. And there are all sorts of reasons to think that the CBO estimate is way optimistic. I don't believe for a moment that one month, three month treasury bill rates are gonna average 2.3% over the next uh, decade. I don't believe for a moment that defense spending as a share of GDP is gonna fall by 20% over uh, the next uh, decade. If anybody believes that 100% of the Trump tax cuts are going to be terminated when they come, do, come up for renewal in 2025, I'd be happy to make them a bet or even happier to sell them a bridge because they're very gullible. So I think if you look at the numbers in the right serious way, you're looking at projected budget deficit that could approach or exceed 10% of uh, GDP. Well, that's fascinating, Larry, because I, I don't want to say you're sounding a little bit like Kevin McCarthy, but you are concerned about the deficit and the debt. Let me talk to you about how we should look at that problem. You just talked about the, uh, the ratio of the debt uh, to the GDP. You wrote a paper with Jason Furman a few years back saying it really is the question of the size of the debt service against GDP. There's a report in Bloomberg this week that said that's what Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, is looking at, and that as she looks at that ratio, it's not that disturbing. Should we be disturbed looking at it through that lens? Look, uh, when you look at it in terms of debt service, David, what that depends on, obviously, is what the level of the interest rate is. And if you believe CBO, that the one month uh, or three month treasury rate is gonna stay below two and a half for 10 years, then you can be serene about uh, debt service. But that's a kind of a sum a can opener uh, approach. My guess, given all the debt that we're accumulating, given what the Fed's gonna have to do to contain uh, inflation, is that rates are gonna have to be substantially higher than that. And if you take a more realistic uh, approach, you are looking at debt service levels that whether you use the nominal interest rate or the real interest rate are getting very close to the levels that Furman and I uh, said uh, would, be, uh, would be dangerous. So I think it's absolutely right to focus on debt service uh, as uh, the issue, but we have, in part because of all the massive QE, where the Fed, which is after all an arm of the government, has bought up all the long-term bonds, we're now running the country's finances like a homeowner with a floating rate mortgage. And if you've got a floating rate mortgage, it's not enough to say that my debt service payments are low right now. You got to think about what could happen uh, in uh, the future. So I don't think that there's a basis for um, high serenity. And I look at all kinds of shocks that could happen uh, coming out of defense spending, coming out of the need to reconstruct Ukraine, coming out of climate situations that look more serious, coming out of the fact that I saw some numbers yesterday that suggests that there's probably a one in three chance that we're gonna have a, another COVID level health event within the next decade. I do think we've got to be preparing for contingencies and this is a time when we need to be reloading uh, in terms of the in, in terms of uh, the fiscal situation. So, Larry, finally, put this all together, if you would. Take take the really robust jobs numbers that we've talked about. Put it together with what you're admonishing the Fed. They should be at least willing to put on the table 50 basis point rate hikes in order to get our arms around inflation, given how strong the economy is. Where are you now on recession? Because people have been talking about recession for a long time. You've been talking about it. I've been talking about it. A lot of people have. We keep putting out the time for it. Uh, where are you on the likelihood of recession, and when does it hit? David, I... I still think uh, that it is soft landings are very unlikely, that it's unlikely that inflation will come down to the two range without an economic uh, downturn. And in a way, it's a policy choice when that downturn uh, comes. And we have put it, we have uh, 
put it off, the worry is that when you delay taking your medication and then you only take part of your medication till you feel better, you don't really get cured and there ends up being more pain uh, down the road. It sure doesn't look to me like we're going near recession um, before the end of the summer. And I, if I had to guess right now, I think the Fed will end up doing enough to restrain inflation. And that's going to mean a quite soft economy sometime in uh, 2024. But the dynamics are very difficult to gauge. Okay, Larry, it's always such a pleasure having you with us. That's Larry Summers of Harvard, our special contributor here on Wall Street Week. Coming up, what do you do when you can't believe your own eyes or ears or even your own lawyer? That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought. Seeing is believing. So said 17th century clergyman Thomas Fuller. But in the age of generative AI, seeing may not be all that it was once cracked up to be. Something Donald Trump Jr. showed us with a Dr. Deepfake version of the office that had presidential candidate Ron DeSantis embarrassed that he'd bought a women's suit. You make one tiny mistake, you're dead. I made one tiny mistake. I wore women's clothes. And it's not just our eyes that AI has made us come to doubt, it's our ears as well. Not to be outdone by his own son, Donald Trump Sr., that's the former president himself, posted on Instagram his own deepfake audio that purported to be a conversation including Elon Musk, Mr. DeSantis, George Soros, and the devil himself. I don't think George knows how to use Twitter. And lest you think that it's only Republicans who are using AI to alter media reality, consider the case of the Democratic senator from Connecticut, Richard Blumenthal, who, as the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, recently started a hearing about regulating chat GPT by opening the remarks generated by, you guessed it, chat GPT itself. We have seen how algorithmic biases can perpetuate discrimination and prejudice. The words were not mine, and the audio was an AI voice cloning software trained on my floor speeches. But let's be honest, none of us was going to be fooled by any of all that, which is more than you can say for the New York lawyer recently caught red-handed, submitting a 10-page brief to the court opposing a motion to dismiss, complete with multiple citations of cases he quoted that seemed just right on point. Unfortunately, neither the judge nor opposing counsel could find the cases that he cited. It turned out that the lawyer had relied on chat GPT, which had simply made it all up. Not exactly what we lawyers had in mind when we pledged to become officers of the court. I will maintain the confidence and preserve the inviolate the secrets of my client. But never fear, at least we have the news media to make sure we're always getting the straight story. Provided, of course, that, that you're getting it from the journalist and not from his own avatar. Joining us now is a very special, slightly weird guest. It is, in fact, my own digital avatar. Avatars have the power to enhance user experiences, enabling immersive virtual interactions and personalized content. They can facilitate remote collaboration, telepresence, and even assist with customer service. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.